Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Colleen Ju, and I am the second vice president of Chapter 65 in San Francisco. Uh, we'd like to have everyone who's um, not a speaker to put themselves on mute so we don't get distracted with dogs barking and birds chirping in the background. So what we're gonna do is um, we are gonna have a presentation today and I'll introduce the speaker in a minute or two and we will have questions and answer. Leslie Ching is going to be monitoring the chat as well as the, um, you can raise your hand and uh, ask questions. Okay. And Martha Roth is going to be monitoring the Zoom and letting people in. And if you have technical issues, uh, just write her a note in chat. Okay, let's see. So um, let me ask Jerry to do a welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I see a lot of uh, faces uh, that haven't been on recently, but um, um, you know, it, it's it's sort of fascinating the uh, whole Zoom process. Um, you know, we've been thinking even as a chapter that even into the future that, uh, you know, we have members outside. I, I noticed Juanita's on and she's from the Seattle area. Uh, but, you know, Vivian got on, she's from over there in Pleasanton, whatever it is. But people are from all over the place uh, that are on our meetings. And so uh, we're, we're sort of, you know, playing with the idea of, you know, one or two meetings a year that they actually be done by Zoom. Um, as opposed to the in-person meetings uh, that we always have had in the past. Um, it is a little easier to just jump out of your pajamas and get on the Zoom uh, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, you know, getting all set up. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's an interesting concept, I think, that, um, you know, we'll be pursuing and, and studying as a chapter. Uh, the second thing uh, is that, you know, I'm just sort of... Uh, Unfortunately, and I, it hasn't been mentioned yet, uh, the uh, speaker from the NTEU was unable to uh, be with us today, but we quickly revamped things and organized and were able to get some other people from another union. Um, but the, the absolutely uh, sometimes incredibly picked upon postal service, uh, you know, NARF has been very connected with uh, the postal service for quite some time. Um, and in fact, sort of uh, took the position somewhat contrary to the, the leadership of the organization at one point in time and said, you know, they're trying to get the Postal Service to make changes to their benefits for people after they've retired. And NARF was adamant about the fact that, um, because NARF, that's what we do, we do benefits. We, we, we look only in that area. And, you know, we did not want to see that uh, the federal government was willing to make changes uh, to people's benefits after they'd retired. Um, and North believes that's a very strong, important uh, position that it takes. And it actually took that position when there was some compromise being worked on where uh, postal employees would have to get Part B of Medicare. Um, and NARF said, no, that's a change of the conditions under which you retired. And so NARF has been a big advocate of, you know, these issues on benefits. Uh, the unions are, are allies, I think. And so we want to see unions as allies to NARF. Uh, while we focus on one thing, they focus on a, a, a many other issues out there. And so uh, we thought that... Uh, you know, we needed someone from a union. Uh, I was real interested in the treasurer's union and I was interested in them primarily because they do such an incredible job in regards to advertising, um, you know, and getting their name out there. They have some incredible ads. If you, if you pay attention, the local radio stations uh, um, on the cable, uh, you, you'll see these ads and they're very supportive of, of you know, good government, good public service, which I think is really, really important. And um, it's something that NARF honors and other unions honor as well. 
But today we're going to talk with folks from the Postal Service. And so um, they've got some issues out there. And if you've been reading it all, uh, a lot of things have been happening and did happen during the previous administration. And now they're looking potentially at some changes, uh, looking at some ways to be an effective organization and have appropriate um, you know, things in regards to their members, uh, both after they retire and before they retire. So anyway, uh, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, thank you for participating. And Pauline's going to lead this meeting and get us um, you know, some information about the union, especially as it relates to postal workers. Thank you so much, Jerry. And yes, let me uh, also extend a welcome to all our uh, members and non-members, other chapter members, and um, other individuals who have joined us today. Welcome. So, you know, you always hear the thing about the postal service and rain and sleet and snow. Well, I'm very pleased that in our uh, hour of need, Carol Maggio, who is the area steward of the National Association of Letter Carriers, has stepped up to help us out because we did have another speaker um, signed up for today. And unfortunately, she had a family emergency. So she was not able to join us today. So let me introduce Carol. And she's going to talk to us about some of the issues facing the Postal Service, a little historical background, and also her personal uh, commitment to uh, federal work and public service. Um, thank you very much. So Carol? Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name again is Carol Maggio. I live in San Rafael with my husband. I have three grown kids and uh, two grandchildren in high school. Um, I was born and raised in San Francisco. My parents were staunch union members. My dad was a butcher in the butcher's union before they merged with uh, UFCW, United Food and Commercial Workers. And he worked in both the wholesale area and the, the retail meat business. Um, my mom was a bookkeeper for a wholesale meat company and she was in um, the Teamsters Union 856. Um, and uh, she was there in that position for a long time. Um, uh, both worked in Old Butchertown, that's how they met, um, in the Third Street and Evans area, close to where the San Francisco Postal Service plant now is. Um, I started in the Postal Service of May 1978. And I officially retired from the Postal Service in October of 2017. And the next day I went to work for the union um, doing higher level grievance work. So I had my 39 and a half years um, and the doctor told me it was time to retire and I did. <laughs> so I became a shop steward six months after I joined um, uh, the Postal Service. And I then became the secretary of the local San Rafael branch in 933. Um, it was uh, called branch 933, along with becoming the chief shop steward a few years later. In 1982, our local merged with the San Francisco branch. And um, in 1984, I became the assistant secretary treasurer for the branch. And I was in that position for 25 years. Uh, Martha and I were on the executive board for most of that time together. Um, and Martha, Diane, and I went to many union conventions together. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. So um, my commitment was to help people. That's why I um, became a member of the union and a steward in the positions I've held um, above that. And um, I also served as the secretary of the California State Association of Letter Carriers, which is the legislative branch um, of the NELC. Each state has an association and we do, you know, legislation, um, we, you know, and uh, a lot of stuff supporting elections and stuff like that. So um, I did that for 10 years. <laughs> um, and um, I'm now, as Martha, as Pauline said, I'm an area steward for um, 
NALC Branch 214, I'm responsible for San Rafael, Corte Madero, and Sausalito post offices. And I do higher level grievances for those offices. I develop cases at a higher level than the, than the regular steward at the station does. And then they get sent up to um, another level um, and then on to arbitration. So when we write a grievance, we have to write as if it's going, as if every grievance is going to arbitration. So um, that's a little bit of my background in history. I just got involved with the NALC because I saw there was a lot of things that needed to be done. Um, I wasn't afraid to speak my mind <laughs> and, uh, you know, give my opinion. And I think, you know, the people's who were in charge at the time saw me as somebody who would who would stay the course and I did so um, uh, other than taking about a year off um, this past year uh, I've been working straight for the NALC um, since I retired so um, I wanted to give you a little background on what we call the pre-funding it's for health benefits. And in 2006, um, <clears throat> they um, enacted uh, a legislation that required the Postal Service to fund, fully fund, not just partially or percentage wise, fully fund their retirement systems. There, there are still civil service um, carriers that are still work active and working. And there's a, the new uh, federal retirement system. If you didn't switch over from civil service to that, that's the new retirement system. So um, they had to, they have to fund those two um, systems in advance. And um, at one point they were funded they were funding and, and, and trying to reach a goal of when it was the inactive, 75% of full funding. And it created a, a big problem with the um, Carol, with the funding I, at the Postal Service. Carol, can I ask a question? Um, sure. I'm not sure how many people understand what the pre-funding is. Okay. Maybe just a little bit farther back about the postal service and why it's under a different retirement system. Why? Oh, why it's under two different retirement systems? Um, prior to, um, I don't remember the exact date, but sometime in the '90s, they switched to a new federal. Um, all the federal departments, all the, you know, if you were in VA, if you were in all these other places, they switched to a new retirement system called FERS, Federal Employees Retirement System. And then those of us who started previous to that um, were in the civil service retirement system, given an option to switch if we wanted to. The federal employees retirement system has a portion put in by the postal service. The a third of the portion is your um, social security and a third of the portion is the thrift savings plan, which uh, has matching money from the postal service up to 5% of your, what you made in that two week period. So those are the two different retirement systems and in um, there was an act called the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act that was enacted, um, which was a law, it was Postal Service Reform with a mandate that USPS, the Postal Service, pre-fund decades worth of health benefits for its future retirees. Um, this liability is unique to the Postal Service since no other public or private enterprise in America is required to pre-fund retiree health benefits. The mandate manufactured a financial crisis in an otherwise profitable agency, the Postal Service. The NELC fully supports the elimination of this mandate through passage of a bipartisan USPS Fairness Act, which is HR 2382. The 
the um, mandate has cost an average of $4.5 billion annually since 2007 and is responsible for 92% of USPS losses over the past 12 years. That's a lot of money. <laughs> And um, it accounts for 100% of losses between 2013 and 2018. The impact of the pre-funding mandate on the Postal Service is in billions. And um, between 2013 and 2018, they had the Postal Service had a loss of $27.8 billion. And the pre-funding Part part of that loss was 31.6 million billion. I'm sorry, billion. So the net income to the postal service, if we did not have prefunding, was 3.8 billion over those um, six years, 2013 through 18. So it's created a lot of problems. So the postal service is continuously running, you know, on that borderline of running out of money. They try to make the payments. They cannot make the full payments. Prior to 20 to 2000, uh, let's see, 2006, they did it on. They paid the actual benefits for the retirees each year, and without a problem. The prefunding is what caused um, uh, a threat of stopping six-day delivery. Um, it it's it, uh, it's uh, gone into services, decreased service standards. It's, uh, you know, uh, the Postal Service was trying to change delivery from each door to what's called delivery box cl clusters on your corner. And most of those are continuously broken into and theft from them. So it's, it didn't just create this you know mandate and put the post postal service in a bad financial position it 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 created stuff that that went out you know that grew from the 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 refund uh, prefunding and um the the resulting losses have been used by um political basically political um people to threaten the core service set that, that the Americans rely on, which is door-to-door -door service, six-day delivery, con convenient post office hours. You'll find some post offices now that close for lunch or they don't start until 10 o'clock instead of earlier. And um, to advance, um, and also the politicalness of this, you know, has been used, the, the financial losses has been used to advance proposal to privatize the postal service and attack the jobs and rights of American postal employees. Um, the Postal Service is at the heart of a $1.4 trillion mailing industry that employs 7.5 million Americans. It, uh, its unmatchable networks link more than 157 million American households and businesses to each other seven days a week. It is essential to our nation's voting systems and multiple industries, communities, popu and populations, including e-commerce, prescription drugs, um, the nation's paper publishing and advertising businesses, and to millions of small businesses and tens of millions of citizens in rural, suburban, and urban communities across the country. The pre-funding mandate forced the Postal Service to um, exhaust its 15 billion borrowing limit with the U.S. Treasury. So um, they were borrowing money from the U.S. Treasury for those first years this was enacted. And then they ran out and then they just defaulted on the payments. Um, so uh, the Postal Service um, has amassed 50 billion for future retiree health um, benefits, enough to cover premiums for 10 to 15 years. Um, ending the mandates 
ending the mandate of the, of the pre-funding would save the, UP, the USPS um, billions annually um, and would go back, if we could get it to go back to the pay-as-you-go system to OPM for um, uh, our retirement benefits because the Postal Service doesn't pay out our retirement benefits. Our retirement benefits gets money gets sent to the Office of Personnel Management and then they manage our retirement, which is, you know, different from, you know, most private sector uh, uh, ways that you do retirement. Your company is your, you know, in, in charge of your funds and whatever for the retirement. So, um, I spoke to John Beaumont, who is used to be the uh, the president of the California State Association of Letter Carriers. He's now he now works for our national office of letter carriers, and he's in charge of 18 the legislative arena for 18 western states. And it's a big area, and he's gone a lot of the time. And he asked me to tell you all that Senator Padilla. Um, and I'm not sure what state Senator Padilla is from, new, uh, has a new state director. His name is Daniel Chen. And um, you, the, he's requesting that we contact the senator through David Chen to co-sponsor co Senate Bill 145. Which Carol, I, I think Padilla is our new uh, senator from California. So oh, he, OK, uh, OK. That yes. I missed. Yeah. <laughs> Taking missed. the place of um, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, yeah. yeah. So, so Senator Padilla hasn't set up his California offices yet. So if I could give you Daniel, um, Daniel's email, if you could encourage him to support the bill, that would be um, you know, great for us. So it's Senate Bill 145. And Daniel's email is Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L, underscore, Chen, C-H-E-N, at Padilla, P-A-D-I-L-L-A, -L -L dot Senate, dot gov. Carol, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the bill that you uh, were asking support for. Uh, do you, basically, what is it, what does it say? What is it, how does it approach the issue of the pre-funding? Um, that was one of the things I, I also reached out to um, John Beaumont, our um, legislative director for this area. And um, I didn't even find out about 140 because it's not listed in our in our paperwork I downloaded from um, our national headquarters to go over with you guys. And um, but there's there's several different options they're they're looking at, and I'm not sure which one they have on the bill. I I bet my based on the fact that we've had these you know bills start, and then then nothing happens with them, and then another yeah. Congress yeah. comes and another bill starts. Um, they are looking. The Postal Service and the NALC want to have it totally eliminated and go back to the pay as you go. There are certain other things they could do. They could reduce the burden of the pre-funding to a lesser amount. Um, so I don't have the exact information on, on the on 145 and I apologize for that, but I would be happy to look it up and get it to you because I only found this out an hour ago. <laughs> So I didn't have time to download it and, and get and it. And there's also a house bill? Is um, there? I believe it's, 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 there's usually a house bill and yeah. usually um, there's a congresswoman in, in the, I want to say San Diego area. Um, and usually Senate bills seem to start for the Postal Service, seem to start with Susan Collins. And I think she's from Maine. Yeah. Um, so I was surprised to see that, 
you know, there were other, there's, you know, the Padilla, you know, hadn't really got on it. You know, I'm, I'm sure with Harris running for, you know, vice executive, what do you call it, vice president, that um, she never got, she just never got to it. So, yeah. um, Martha just put Martha just put in the chat the the House bill and the Senate bill both of them together, okay. um, and and also a, a link that people you can copy that link there, um, or, or uh, sometimes even click on it and it will take you to the Fairness Act, um, and so you should be able to see uh, and better understand exactly what's being asked for. Right. Exactly. But as you say, they, they tend to compromise between the House and the Senate and eventually come up with something. And as you say, there's probably different proposals as to the extent of the pre-funding or, or the complete elimination of the pre-funding. Right. Um, yeah. I just put in the link from NARF to support the USPS Fairness Act. So for NARF members, you can go there directly and, uh, and, and support the act. Right, and so that means if you're a NARF member, actually anyone can go in. If you click on the Legislative Action Center, you can go in, you can see the letter that they've prepared, you can adjust the letter, you can change the letter, you can download the letter, or even just click a button and it goes to your congressperson based upon your address. And so it, you know, I think these are important things. Um, and clearly, um, you know, the unfairness <laughs> of the free funding uh, sticks out like a sore thumb. Everyone thinks the Postal Service is inefficient and ineffective and overspending or something like that. When in effect, uh, we're really talking about something quite different. And we're talking yeah. about the fact that that they would have been they would have been in the black rather than the red um without having the pre-funding is pretty profound uh, yeah. you know our letter carriers are pretty are pretty diverse um women are 30 percent of the all the letter carriers um african -American, african americans 21 percent latino 12 percent asian american pacific islanders are 9%, um, and the average letter carrier age is 48, which is, you know, I knew it was it was up there, but that was surprising to me. And the average job tender and uh, that a, a member has is 17 to 20 years. So um, we're involved in the com in communities. Usually we, usually carriers if we can afford it, can't always afford it in California in the urban areas, but usually letter carriers are living in their communities and they, you know, provide um, a lot of stuff. We have almost every month in our magazine, we have letter carriers that are, are you know, listed as heroes, you know, saving an elder that fell down, um, saving, uh, you know, animals, uh, getting people out in fires. I mean, it's usually because they're they're on every street and these things happen. And the, sometimes the letter carrier sees a theft and will report it. Um, we, ha we have the, the biggest food drive in um, the United States nationwide. Um, and it's usually the second Saturday in May and um, we have collected over the years since it started 1.5 billion pounds of food. Um, and we do it in May, which is, you know, um, going right before it goes into um, summer, the food, the food banks get hit pretty hard. So um, we became the first national sponsor of um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and we still do a lot of fundraising for them. Um, you know, we're, we're in the neighborhoods, we work in the neighborhoods, you, we usually live in the neighborhoods. We, we hire the majority of the veterans um, coming out of sometimes their 20 years of service or whatever amount of years they serve. Um, we have veterans preference. So, um, 
and letter carriers, you know, it's a hard job. It's, it's, it's not an easy job. Oh, you're outside all day. And that's great because you're not the supervisors and they're watching you all day, but um, it's a very physical job. And most of the time, by the time we hit 50, we we're feeling the aches and pains, but a letter carrier pushes through the, the mail, the, the snow, <laughs> That whole term is on the, I believe it's the New York main post office building carved in the granite um, right on the upper level. So um, through rain, through sleet, through snow, that's carved there. So we're, you know, we're unique. Um, in 1970, we had a big postal strike. And after that, it was changed from the U.S. post office to the US Postal Service, we got collective bargaining um, and we've been there ever since. <laughs> so um, thank you everybody. If you have more questions, you know, or think of something else, just ask me away. <laughs> um, one of the things, you know, if I can really just take something really quick, we started delivering Amazon parcels um, a while ago on Sundays. So there's a lot of places we still deliver packages for Amazon on Sundays. We deliver the last, what's called the last mile. When UPS, FedEx, or any of your local delivery companies can't either get to an area or it's not profitable for them to get to an area, we carry those, their parcels what's called the last mile. So in parentheses, it's not always a mile, it might be more, <laughs> but we carry those packages for them. Um, you know, it might be someplace where they can't get, you know, down the driveway to deliver the package because their trucks are, are larger than ours, or um, it's not profitable for them to go into an area and we get those parcels. So, um, Carol, uh, do, do, do you folks um, advertise at all, um, I guess is where I'm going, PR, in reference to, um, you know, the, the service that the, you know, the Postal Service accomplishes the, yeah, I mean, and, and this whole issue, I mean, as I say, there's people out there talking about the Postal Service as being um, you know, incompetent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because it loses so much money. Um, and, you know, are there messages being presented that help clarify this and help uh, give a better perspective on what's really occurring? I guess that's where I'm going. With it. We have a lot of, of carriers I know in California that are like their, um, their locals or their branches, um, editors so they do a lot of writing to the news the local newspapers to get that, uh, that kind of word out uh, yeah. um, I see a lot of that I sometimes I get copies of them still because I was you know, secretary for so long of the California State Association of Letter Carriers and um, they advertise the Postal Service advertises um, they have commercials uh, and some of them are some of them are cute some of them are you know pretty accurate then they you know try to show positive sight to delivering to to america um but they don't advertise the um the issues we, it's all sort of within the union when we get asked to speak we go out and we act and speak at groups like this or their or our national president or one of the officers will be asked to go to someone's national convention and speak there and we talk about these issues um, the Postal Service itself is not allowed to lobby Congress. So they have to do it through the unions. So we actually have um, a Western States lobby trip that they put on and um, the national, you know, sponsors for us. And we go back to DC um, 
which of course that has, didn't happen last year. Don't know whether it'll happen this year, but probably the next year after that, we'll be back on a regular schedule of doing the lobbying so that the Congress people, you know, can, can learn about our, our stuff. We, we still have stuff that was enacted to budget, to help, but help the budget um, be passed in, um, in the 70s with Ronald Reagan. And he, he we got, ended up with a lot of bad, um, uh, we took a social security hit. So if you were a civil service employee, you did not have social security taken out of your check if you, when you worked for the postal service. But if you had another job, like my union job when it was part-time and, and, and the local took out social security, they, the way Reagan balanced the budget, we always said it was on the backs of letter, letter carriers because what happened is then we got our social security taken away. <laughs> So, um, uh, hang on just a second. Um, so, uh, we got our social security taken away and reduced, considerably reduced for having a job, um, that, uh, you know, we did, we didn't have social security taken out. So we sh basically, we shouldn't get any because people thought we were double dipping, but we did work. And we did put our money in and we should have been getting up that social security, but um, you either lost the whole thing or got a reduction. I know some person right. who worked a lot and got a hundred dollars. Right. It's the same thing currently for people who were in uh, CSRS and who basically worked other jobs. Um, and it it's actually affects teachers in, in California. It affects a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's one of NARF's uh, current legislative initiatives. And again, if you go to the NARF.org uh, website, you'll see a letter there, uh, another letter that references this whole issue of uh, yeah. how people who paid into Social Security are receiving, eh, I get it actually. And, you know, because I worked at another job prior to working for the federal government. And so you get about half or less of the Social Security that someone else might get. Um, and so there's not too many of us left, but uh, it's still out there. It's still in other governmental organizations, as I say, besides federal government. Right. And um, if you're interested in that bill, uh, the GPO and WEP, uh, you can, uh, you know, get a letter again on our website that helps you if you want to design your own, or if you just want to send it off to your local congressional folks and your senators. Uh, yeah. yeah.